This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Artistic Director of the Pittsburgh Public Theater, Mariah C. Kaminsky, recently arrived in Pittsburgh after four years as the Associate Artistic Director at Seattle Repertory Theater. One of the highlights of her tenure there was spearheading a collaboration with New York's Public Theater and Dallas Theater Center to create Public Works Seattle. This initiative was based on long-term authentic partnerships between regional theaters and local nonprofits and designed to make theater of of, by, and for the people. Earlier in her career, Mariah co-founded the Washington Ensemble Theater and served as co-artistic director there for five years, leading season planning and new play development. She's worked as a director, writer, producer, and actor, and is a proud member of the Stage Directors and Choreographer Society, Actors Equity Association, and the Society of Authors and Dramatic Composers. Mariah has taught and lectured on theater at Hollins University, the University of Washington, and at Cornish College of the Arts, where she was awarded the Drama Department's Award for Teaching Excellence. She's also been honored with the Genius Award in Theater from the Seattle News Weekly, The Stranger, and has been recognized as an Artist of the Year by Seattle Magazine. For all those reasons and so many more, it is a true privilege for me to have Mariah C. Kaminsky as my guest on StoryBeat today. Mariah, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's so great to be here. Oh, thank you for coming. Well, tell us a little bit about your history. What led you to become a theater artist in the first place? Where does this start? Mm, way, way back, way, like it does for most, most of us. Of us. I think, Correct. yeah. Um, I started doing plays when I was just a kid. Uh, my mother put me into dance classes and theater classes when my brothers were born mm -hmm. uh, to give me something to do, I think. Um, and uh, pretty soon, uh, when I was in uh, late elementary school and middle school, uh, I moved on from plays and started doing auditions in New York City, commercial auditions. Well, did you grow up in New York? I actually grew up upstate, Rochester, New York, so, up by Canada. So it wasn't hard for you to get down there? Well, it's normally a six-hour drive. With my mom, it was usually more like nine. <laughs> uh, so they were, they were field trips. But um, gosh, I remember just walking into those audition studios and walking into those theaters, and it felt like the ground vibrated. What, what age were you when you were doing this in New York? Uh, you know, I think it sort of started around second grade. Oh, second through very like young. Seventh grade, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so you were seven, eight, nine years old, somewhere in there. Yeah, and seeing the big city and absorbing all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I caught the bug there, you know. It's interesting. I asked the question about the bug of lots of artists yeah. because that bug, once it, once it gets in your bloodstream, it's really hard to get back out. In fact, it never gets out. Yeah. And, you're, yeah. and some people like you get to fulfill the, you get to work the bug. Yeah. Some, some people don't. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So uh, how old were you when you discovered that you you actually had this talent. I w was was talent something you knew early on, or did it take a while? Oh my gosh! Well, I had good parents who told me that a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think it does take a minute for us to figure that out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it was you something know, you loved, though, from the beginning. Yeah, it's some place where I felt like I belonged, and I think it, you know it, that bug, whatever it is for us, uh, I don't think ever changes. And I think that the real key to it for me was connection. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was connected to other people. I was connected to an audience. I was sort of living in this um, world of shared truth, mm -hmm. and that I just couldn't get enough of. It, it, did you feel, as many people do, that when you were walked into a, a theater or a rehearsal room that you were at home? Absolutely. So that, Absolutely. I hear this all the time, that it's, yeah. it's, it's like going home. Absolutely. Well, and it's funny, you know, uh, so many artists are so transitory, um, 
But I think that pervades, right? You can walk into any theater around America and be like, oh, I know what happens here. I know where I belong. So so when I see a Skena from a distance, I know, oh, there's the place I'm going to be comfortable. (laughs) Because I know that that, because you can always tell a Skena from the distance because it's always a windowless box. It's above everything else, (laughs) right? Truly, yeah. So, um, all right. So um, what did you do then as a young person to develop that talent? Yeah, well, I I took um, really rigorous classes, actually, and I I think there are a lot of young people who pursue it it that way. Um, I had dance classes every night of the week. I had rehearsals all day on Saturday and Sunday. I really threw myself in it entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, my father only allowed me to do that because he thought it'd make me a better lawyer. (laughs) Is your dad a lawyer? (laughs) He's not. He was was a chemical engineer, but uh, yeah. Was it it either doctor or lawyer for you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think it was lawyer or um, curator. thought I'd be a good curator. So I guess I do a little bit of both of those now. Um, <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. You, you are a curator <laughs> of sorts. You definitely yes. do. You you definitely set up, pro- just like a museum would, yeah. you set what's going to be in the space for this particular time. Absolutely. I, I love it. I think that's a great way to think of it. Um, who were your earliest inspirations? Mm. Who, who did you, what artists or performers or so on did you really look up to early on? Yeah, I think... Uh, Early on, I was most inspired by uh, writers. I was exposed to theater thanks to some wonderful people in my life who took me to children's theater, Mm -hmm. took me to places like Nazareth Academy who were doing great plays then. And um, so I was mesmerized by theater. But in terms of artists, you know, I I really was drawn to like Sylvia Plath and Mm. Annie Dillard and Joan Didion and The Beats. The uh, at, in high school, yeah. So that idea of performance poetry and what, how language and space and time Ginsburg, intersect. Ginsburg, oh, yeah. that, that whole ilk. Oh, yeah. That that really inspired That's me. That's very interesting yeah. because I think I can tell you from my own experience that a lot of this generation that we have now don't even know what you're talking about. Isn't it wild? It is yeah. wild. It's like it's it's almost gone. It'll it, Like all things, it will come back into vogue. But it's not in vogue right now. Well, and they have their own. Right. They like do. the way the beat spoke to me in terms of the wide permission and the discovery, yeah. you know, they, they have their own writers who are Abs- doing that. Absolutely. So so theater was essentially your first creative love. There wasn't something prior to that or was there? Uh, it was and, and, and dance. But, you know, thinking about process and thinking about how I got better, I was always writing and I was always sort of partaking writing. in reflective process. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that's probably what allowed me to improve as I was thinking about how things were going, how my own process was working. Were you writing um, prose at that time or were you writing drama? Or? Well, you know, the grandiosity of a high school student. Yes. I thought I was invite- inventing prose poetry, of you know. You <laughs> um, but, you know, I was journaling. It was a lot of memoir. I was writing solo performance really early, writing monologues, it sort of inspired by the beats, inspired by things like Howl. Were you writing them and then performing them? Yes. You were. So yes. you were then memorizing what you'd written. Yes. That's very interesting. Did yeah. you, was that something somebody told you to do, or did you do it on your own? You um, self-motivated. You know, I think I was so moved by these great roles in the theater, by Shakespeare, by the great leading ladies, mm-hmm. and I felt like a lot of that was very unattainable as a young artist. So I decided to write them for myself. Uh, so uh, that led me to solo performance really early and eventually to busking. Um, you really? Oh yeah. Where did you do that? In, uh, Ro- in Rochester? The subway platforms across New York City. I started. Really? Uh, yeah, I started in Philadelphia. Took a show to Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and then when I moved to New York, you know, I was working three jobs and not doing a lot of acting, so I would sort of create my own opportunities. Okay, this I've got to hear. So, ha- tell me what you did as a busker. What were you actually <laughs> doing? Were you were you singing? Were you performing? Were you doing mime? What, were you playing I, a guitar? What I, were you doing? I was playing guitar. I was tap dancing. I had a tap really? floor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I started it. Uh, <laughs> I was working at a falafel place right around Washington Square Park. And, uh, you know, my second day in, I was like not making any money. And it was clear that this was going to be a bleak prospect. And I burnt my hand really bad on the pita warmer. And I was like, I, enough of this, enough of this. But I really needed cash, of course. Oh. So I went home to my room in Astoria and got my guitar and I went back to Washington Square Park and just started busking. And that sort of started that process. And, and I'm assuming people gave you some money. They gave me some money. I think they were more amused than fully entertained. But it also, it started me on a, it's it's funny, I look at what we're trying to do at Pittsburgh Public right now and uh, I can see the line draw back to that, you know, that... Isn't busking, it interesting how those links in the chain keep going? Truly, truly. That busking, you know, it was so fun to create my own opportunity and write my own stories, and that's always been um, a great inspiration. But I also loved it because it wasn't preaching to the choir. 
that I was uh, that I was gathering an audience that was perhaps an unexpected audience mm-hmm. who had not seen something like this before. It was not someone you would expect to show up at a theater on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, you know, reaching well, more and, people. And you were truly proving yourself out in the real world. Oh yeah. I mean that's that's by really, hook or by crook. By hook or by crook. <laughs> and that that is no question. That's I think that's one of the bravest and most challenging things that any artist, any performer can do is just go out in the street and do it. Oh yeah. It's it's uh, mortifying. But you know, I'll tell you, I was doing it in New York to some success and then I went to Edinburgh and I saw real buskers work. And I learned a lot about audience. I learned a lot about um that dynamic. I mean, great buskers will gather their audience, right? Gather them close. How they'll do start, they do it? They'll start to create density. You know? how, how do they do it? Um, you know, they'll start. Uh, one of the ways they'll do it is they'll start with big presentation, very loud. They're ga- capturing your attention, mm-hmm. and then they'll pull everybody in to see a very small magic trick. Mm. And once you see people gathering like that, you're like, oh, what's going on over there? So you know, so in like in the theater, yeah. The quieter you get, sometimes the more the audience has to lean into you. And so that's what they're doing is they come large to bring small so that you keep leaning in, correct? Yes. And it casts the audience in a role, right? You're participant now. Sure. And do you feel like that's something that you strive for with Pittsburgh Public, that you're you're doing things that draw the audience further in? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I I actually think that's why we... I'll get up in the morning. I know you did it with Tempest. Oh, uh, you know, thanks. Uh, definitely. Because, yeah. and, I, and the space itself at Pittsburgh Public draws the audience in because it's three-quarter round, basically. Right? It's or, so intimate. It's so big. It's 600 seats, yeah. but it is so intimate for that reason. Yeah, yeah. because you've got folks right there on, uh, practically on stage with the performers. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Um, uh, aside from the this task of making gigantic performances and productions at Pittsburgh Public. What do you do now to advance your own skills and talents? And uh, obviously you're probably pretty busy, yeah. but how do you, what do you do to keep yourself uh, going? With my practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. It's That's a question I ask a lot of people, and I'd love to hear what yours is too, because I know you're very busy in terms very. of um, all of the things that are happening around here. But, um, you know, it's funny. I, I often ask people, how's your art heart? Because I feel like artists, you know, being an artist is one part hustle. Yes. And one part heart, yes. you know? And so uh, when I think about what I do for my art heart is, uh, you know, I try to get into rehearsal. I try to keep writing. I try to have reflective practice. I try to have quiet time mm-hmm. every day to connect to that that sense of wonder that it, I think keeps us coming back no matter how tricky or challenging or um, unsteady How do you feels. feel on days when you can't get there? Hungry. Hungry. Lost a little bit, yeah. honestly. You yeah, that's it, really my you? anchor. Yeah. That's where you, that's, well, I have a question later, but we're sort of answering it now, which is how do you refuel? How do you refill your soul? And that's what you need. Yeah. It's you, funny. I often think to refill my soul, I think I need a rest. And that is often true. We probably, none of us probably sleep enough. Uh-uh. Um, but it's often <laughs> I need a change. It, it often means I need to go outside, I need to take a walk, I need to open up a book that is not related to anything I'm working on. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It, otherwise, you get stale. Yeah. You know, and as soon as you get stale, you're useless. Yeah. At least I think I am when I, when I start to get sale. The, it, to, because this show's not about me, but I'll answer I it real quickly. Know, yeah. it, it, my way of doing it, which is really hard right now, the podcast itself that we're doing right now is one of my outlets because this is more of an avocation than a full-time job. My full-time job is as a professor at a university. Yeah. This is something that I do for fun and on the side. And, and it, I learn so much doing this. And so that by itself is fulfilling. And then I'm also part of a group here in Pittsburgh called Musical Theater Artists of Pittsburgh. And we're constantly talking about what's the next thing that we're going to do. In fact, we'll be uh, performing uh, our for the third time our Hot Metal Musicals in July of this year. Wow. Which you'll be welcome to come to Terrific. if you wish. Yeah. And we will have 19 original songs played in that. Wow. Never, never heard before. Yeah. Well, maybe one, but they're, they're all original. So that's the kind of thing. And then I keep up my writing. I have all kinds of projects I keep going. It's really hard to teach full-time, do a podcast, and be a writer. I can imagine. That's really challenging. Well, they all take creative energy. It, incredible. Yeah. And I... I are you the type of a writer that needs to get into a groove and a rhythm, or are you able to do it piecemeal? 
I tend to do it in bursts. In I, bursts. I, you know, it's funny to hear how the podcast plays a role in your creative life mm-hmm. because one of the things that I find very inspiring is to learn about other people's practices, mm-hmm. learn about other people's writing practices especially. Sure. Um, and I was just with friends at UT Austin a couple of weekends ago for their New Works Festival, and I was asking them, you know, how do you do it, you know, um, run this program and stay creative. And uh, they have a practice of getting up at 5 a.m. every morning Ugh. and writing that way. And that I wish that was me, but it's not. I, I sort of need to take a weekend every six months. I'm a six in the morning guy, but I tell you what, I, I, I <laughs> can't get up intense. and write. No, five is too much. That's <laughs> that's just a little over the top for me. All right. So when you start to work on, obviously you both produce and you gather and you also direct and so on. So when you're beginning to work on a show, we'll talk about pl- the planning process in a bit, but mm-hmm. when you begin to work on an actual, here's the show we're going to do next, and you're the director of it, yeah. where do you begin? Uh, beyond reading the script, obviously, where do you yeah. begin? What do you do? Yeah, um, there's a couple of initial things that ele- that create a door for me into the process. Okay. Um, you know, Twella Tharp in her beautiful book, The Creative Habit, talks mm-hmm. about start a box. Start right, a start box. a box, put the name of the show on the box, and start putting things in the box. Right, materials, photos, you know, whatever starts to Very sort good. of build the world. And uh, I don't start a box, but I do start a binder. <laughs> good, you're a binder person. Three, I am um, three ring loose leaf, uh, three ring binder, and they usually, you know, they end up bursting out at the sure. seams. But I love them as archives at the end too. I feel like they can sort of hold do you the have whole a shelf process. full of these at this I point? Do. Yeah, I bet yeah. you do. Um, so I start that and I start gathering materials that sort of resonate with the world of the play. I start a Spotify playlist, you know, about, you know, songs that feel like they live near mm. the world of the play. Um, but I am also the kind of artist, I need a lot of structure. I need a lot of restraints to be creative. So I start to really examine the structure you, of the you, play. You're talking about you need structure in the play or you need structure in your life or both? Uh, well, probably both. Uh, but in terms of the creative process, like one of the very first things I'll do is just create a scene breakdown. Um, and just try to look visually at what the shape of the play is mm-hmm. and what the what the where the themes are, where the characters show up. Um, so I, I'll start to look at the the structure. Uh, but I also try to do uh, a little bit of an interrogation um, about what my personal connection is to that play. Why this play? Because sometimes we don't know. It's you know, it's right. very subconscious, right? I'm drawn to this project. Um, but I do that for two reasons. One is I think a lot of those are doors, you know. Um, you know, right now I'm working about to work on Marjorie Prime, which is right. a play about technology and grief. Yep. I've certainly experienced a great deal of grief in my life. And so that is a doorway for me to sort of peek through into the play. But I also have found that it can those sorts of affinities can also be a trap. Because while the play is about grief, it's not necessarily about my grief. So I like to pull those out as flags of like I can I can plant this flag in the ground. This is a door, but also pos- mm-hmm. possibly mm-hmm. a tripwire. Well, uh, um, again, not to dwell on me at all, but we Please, have we yeah. have that we have that in common. The grief bit. Yeah. Yeah. We both have we've both been through whatever mills we've been through. Yeah. Uh, so all right. So once you start to dig into how this is to you personally, how yeah. so you're you're now looking for ways that it truly relates to you. Yes. You're looking for a relationship so that you can then, what, sense the emotion of it so you can communicate that? Yeah. Well, I think it's what um, distinguishes what we do, or at least what I do from what a journalist does um, or what an analyst does, that I really think that our way into work is through the heart. Um, so, uh, yes, it's how I, how do I relate to it? How can I articulate it? How can I open up the door for other people, um, like a cast, like a design team, like an audience? Sure. Um yeah, yeah. And so, so the the business that we're in uh, that that I teach all the time, which is true, either be theater or movies or TV, it doesn't matter, even writing books. It's really about uh, emotion. It's really about being visceral. It is not about intellectuality. You, the artist, must have a degree of intellectuality about how you face the p- blank page or whether you're taking this thing and you're going to interpret it into something else. That's intellectual. Yeah. But the but the end product is guts. It's passion. Yeah, and I, I absolutely, and I think it's different for different artists. Certainly, mm-hmm. there are artists out there driven by the intellect. But I would say even Tom Star- Tom Stoppard, that at the heart of his plays it's, are human relationships. Of course, it's yeah. still about emotion, even though he's a really hyper intellectual writer. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think there is such a thing as an audience that's interested in going to the theater for a night of um, of deep thinking. No one wants to be taught anything. No, and I actually think that is a uh-huh. And yet, and yet, our job is to actually teach while we're giving them entertainment. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think for me, I think it's to 
connect. Yeah, I, but because I think a trick in the theater and something that I have to watch in myself is um, leaning towards the didactic. Mm. You know that it that um, it is through the heart, not the head, that we get to work. And I also feel like you know, going back to your question about finding our own threads and through lines mm -hmm. into projects, um, I do believe, and I know it's sort of a trope right now, but that the very personal is very universal. So if I can find that chord that it strikes with me, that chord will resonate with other people. That's one of the things that's mystifying to me about uh, both politics and gender relations and race relations that that we get to explore in the theater, which is one yeah. of the beauty parts of the theater, is that we are all at heart the same, mm -hmm. even though we come from cultural backgrounds that are different. Yeah, um, very. And so I think that's the that's what's great about the theater in particular is that it bridges those gaps. Yeah, it bridges those gaps. I also feel like, you know, we are in so many exciting conversations culturally about mm -hmm. race, about gender, uh, and it can bridge those gaps, but it can also show us where they are. You it, know, sure. I think it's so easy to make assumptions about other people, and theater lives on that edge of culture do, where through storytelling we can. Don't we have to find identify them are. before we can actually do anything about them? Yeah, identify with each other. So, and I think the theater helps us to identify those because artists will come out and, and explore those things where someone isn't thinking about it at all. Then you go out to a night of the theater, and the next thing you know, you're starting to think about those yeah, things. Yeah. I think that's the beauty part about it. Okay, so part of your job at the public is to plan seasons to come. And Indeed. You've and yeah. you've had a lot of experience with this at other theaters as well. A bit, yeah. Um, all right. I'm very curious about this because yeah. I've never planned a theater season, though I've been around people doing so. Um, where do you begin? You, how, how well do you have to know your core subscribers and your audience in order to plan your season? Extremely it's well. It's a great question. I'm Well, and I have just um, confronted this question mm -hmm. in a really challenging way, actually, in my move here to Pittsburgh. Um Cause because you're not a Pittsburgher, so no, you have I, to learn the you have to learn your market. Yeah, and I do think that theater is a dialogue. I, I truly don't believe in art for art's sake. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in art to a purpose and to connect people. Um, so in order to do that, there's got to be a conversation. So you know, this current season, uh, with so much help from Lou Costelli, my producing partner, yep. and the senior staff yep. at Pittsburgh Public, we've put together this inaugural season for us, for this new leadership team that has been going really beautifully. Uh, but I have to tell you, the learning curve has been amazing this year. <laughs> because it is. I, I, bet, I, think, I bet. It's been steep. Uh, yeah, and I think that my job... Um, the service that I've been hired to provide mm -hmm. is to find the Venn diagram, the sweet spot where my skill set and my aesthetic um, intersect with the appetite and interests of this audience. With, so, yes, that takes a lot of listening. And that's, a, that's a, I imagine, a challenge coming off of Ted being here, Ted Pappas being here, who, yeah. who's been on Storybeat, um, his having been there for so long. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. he, I think, very well tapped into the, the what the zeitgeist was for a long time. The question is, is, how do you dig in and make it your own? Well, sure, make it my own. I, I actually don't even think... It, I feel like we're going through a change in the American theater right mm -hmm. now where um, we're positing that our these theaters, these huge public institutions, do not belong to any one person, do not belong to any one artist. Sure. I don't think Pittsburgh Public Theater is or should belong to me. I actually, I actually think it should belong to Pittsburgh. So what is it to move from this model of it being identified solely with a single artist to it truly belonging to each of us. And and to me, it's, that's the sweet spot I'm after. It's not necessarily making Pittsburgh public my own. It's what can we make together. Well, I think there's, it, it, you're correct. Um, I think inevitably um, it's going to reflect your values and tastes. Of course, of course. You know, um, yeah. it's, uh, unless you wanted to do it demographically, which I don't think is the way to go, <laughs> it's going to reflect yeah. your values and taste, which yeah. I think is exactly what the audience will then come to desire. Because you pick this and they like that, so pick some more for me, yeah. right? So where do you begin? What do you yeah. what do you start to do? Well, it's funny you bring up values because um, I start almost every process at the theater, whether it's budgeting or season planning or talking to staff about an, something that's coming up with the audience um, with values. I really believe in values based mm -hmm. leadership. That's been transform transformative for me. Um, so I start with integrity. Uh, and for me, integrity is about honesty, but also about completeness. Completeness is everybody at the table so that needs to be here. Define that for for us, for the listeners. What do you mean by completeness? And what, uh, explain how that works. Yeah, I, I think it means like for season planning example, mm -hmm. for example, uh, that it cannot take place in a vacuum. 
that we have to have uh, artist input, staff input, board input, and mm. audience input, mm -hmm. um, that the process is complete when everybody is there in some way. And when, when constituent, one of those constituents yeah. feels left out, you have a problem, don't you? Well, sure. And I, I'm sure you don't yeah. at the public, but there yeah. are theaters that do oh, have that Oh, no, problem. absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, part of, I, I really think that these artistic leadership jobs are service jobs. So how do we create more platforms well, for listening and conversation? You're sort of the fulcrum between uh, the board and the public and the, the artists. You're sort of in the middle. Totally. You're, you're Rome, essentially, and all roads <laughs> are going to lead through you. Luckily with Lucas Deli, with, which uh, is great. Very good. Yes. And, and, but you have, the, I think, I'm just guessing now because, sure, again, yeah. I haven't done what you've done, but it's yeah. I can make the leap to imagine that that position requires being a little bit of all, all things to all people to a certain extent. Which is why values are so handy, mm -hmm. you know, because I feel like we can all agree on that, you know. Okay, so I'm going to guess that yeah. you have at least bumped into one or more people who maybe don't agree with your values or, or, or maybe think differently than you in some way. How do you manage that? What do you do? Yeah, well... Um, I actually, I don't, I think it's quite rare to bump into somebody who doesn't believe that's... in integrity and rigor. You know, I think we can oh, all, sure. we can all agree on that. And so that's where those conversations start I for think me. I'm talking about artistic taste. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I'm going to guess that you're going to pick shows over the years sure. that someone on the board of directors is going to go, I don't like that show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, to me, I yes, there have been moments of that this year, and I expect more mm -hmm. in the years to come. Uh you know, art is meant to make us respond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever I hear something like that or somebody reaches out to me, I, I, I have the conversation. I mean, that's what we're here for. It's what didn't you respond to? This is what we were interested in. This is what we were inspired by with this work. Mm. Uh, and how did it not align for you? How did it not click for you? Um, and I will tell you that really without exception, those conversations are always really meaningful. And I learned something, and I, I hope they do too. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that you're open to those things because I certainly in my long years of doing this I've bumped into people who wouldn't entertain it at all oh, sure. they would be shut off to it sure. um, so I, I, I like to hear that I like p artists that are open to things yeah yeah and I think yeah. that that's, think that's really cool job. okay so when you co-founded the Washington Ensemble Theater yeah I'm curious about the process the challenges and the joys of starting something from scratch like that what, oh yeah oh yeah what, um, tell us about how that works yes yeah, certainly that was remains the most exciting era of my artistic life okay, and to, certainly the most exciting thing I've ever break it, break had it down to have a the experience bit. of. Um, so in our second year at graduate school, mm -hmm. um, John Jory, who of course is the a great John Jory, the great John Jory, right? Who shaped so many theaters across Inclu America, including Louisville. Yes. Louisville, um, Long Wharf, et cetera. Right. Um, uh, was our teacher and created a course for us, as he was wont to do, sort of out of thin air, saying how to start an ensemble theater company. Mm -hmm. And we went through a process, a rigorous process of what, why, how, where, how do you raise the money, who decides the season, you know, who buys the toilet paper when you run out of toilet paper. You know, really very practical <laughs> the devil's questions. devil's in the details, isn't it? Yeah, certainly, yeah. and with a great mentor. So we sort of went through this class, and I was in a class of 12, um, and many of us were really inspired by it um, and uh, caught the idea uh, that we could actually do this. And we're, the winds of fate blew in our favor, uh, and we were... Um, given the opportunity to move into a small 49-seat theater uh, in the heart of Seattle's Capitol Hill District wow, in nice. 2004. Um, and uh, 49 seats, that's really tiny. It was so tiny. And I, the bathroom was on stage. I mean, it was it really? was a very intimate experience. Um, <laughs> and we were, let's see, we were seven performers and four designers. Uh, and we agreed on a consensus model for mm. everything. Um, you know, and I think that's youth and idealism. You, you know, it, You were a kibbutz. Uh, <laughs> we were. And it wasn't the most efficient way to work, but it certainly was um, the most inspiring. And, I, you know, it's funny. I think my big takeaway from that time is, you know, as a young artist, it can be hard to promote oneself, right? It can be hard to articulate what you want to do and why someone should let you do it. But it was not hard to promote the 10 other artists I was working with because I believed in them so deeply. How old were you at this time? Oh, gosh, I was... 25, 26? Oh, so quite young. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so what were the big challenges? Uh, the consensus model was the blessing and the challenge, mm -hmm. right? Achieving consensus artistically, um, administratively across 11 folks. Um, but, you know, the big challenges, and I, I believe this even with what we are um, 
uh, experiencing at the public with this transition after so long um, of a terrific leader under Correct. Ted Pappas. Sure. Um, in the challenges, there are opportunities, right? As the consensus model became more challenging, we became smarter in terms of dividing our skill sets, um, prioritizing our needs. You know, I think where we landed is like, okay, what really needs to be consensus? Oh, the season. Right, we all need to be in agreement about what we're going to produce, but everything else we can start to divide. That's a good thing. So some of the yeah. the group doesn't think I'm not doing this this week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, as the challenges rose, you know, if we can, as we face them together, which was really the magic of that moment for us in our art making, um, they truly did turn into opportunities. And you did a little of everything, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. We all did. It was certainly. Yeah, I was directing. I was acting. I was writing. Um, head of new play development for a moment. Head of development, head of marketing. So when, yeah. okay, so I'm, I'm also curious about, uh, you've, you've, you've both written and directed your own work at the same time. You obviously did that as a, as a young person, you've already yeah. said by writing and memorizing and doing monologues. Yeah. Um, but were you doing that here as well, where you were writing pieces that you were directing? So you were both the writer and the director? I, yes, I have been. I have been. I was doing that in Seattle. And, and then I got to do that with The Tempest a bit in the adaptation. You did, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Of course, uh, there was a pretty good uh, playwright ahead of you there. It, that was a fine <laughs> collaboration, yes. William and me. Yeah, B Billy, yes. Billy, as we like to call him, <laughs> yes. um, Mr. Shakespeare. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, when you were writing and directing your own stuff, yeah. I am very curious. Did you ever... Get into an argument with the writer as the director. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, so what do you do? <laughs> I find that um, actually, and I only mean this when you are splitting the roles. I do not mean this in a more traditional process. Sure. But uh, I always need to fire the writer at some point. <laughs> you know, I, I need to have the writer step back and the director Isn't, take the helm. Do you, do you, have you developed plays with other writers? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. And so have you had to fire them too? <laughs> no, it's a little different when the playwright's in the room. I mean, I... It's so different, actually, because I don't know how you feel about this, but I actually feel like we're in a renaissance of playwriting in America. I, I feel like the playwright is at the are. center of the creative process and for the American theater. And more importantly, it, it's becoming more and more apparent because of television and the way that it has split up into cable yeah. that the playwright, and that's where they come from, the great ones, the playwrights are now the great producers of television. Absolutely. So you Absolutely. get Aaron Sorkin. And you get oh, folks yeah. like that. I mean, the great playwrights are also TV producers, not so much movie producers, yeah, but play, uh, play and television producers. And so, all right, so so, so it's hard to fire them. It, they're they're sort of critical. You, in the, in you the process. would if you were making movies or TV, you would <laughs> fire them because that is that process. But in the theater, the yeah. the, the, the the author still has his copy, his or her copyright. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. And I think you know, so many writers are working just so deftly these days and in the way that you're saying they're jumping platforms they're jumping mediums um and so many of them are more than writers they are producers even in the theater so yeah that voice is critical okay in the so, room in the so now you're process. you're now working as a director or producer or both sure. with a new play and a playwright yeah or maybe it's even a playwright nobody's ever heard of maybe sure. somebody you've bumped into what are the challenges of that when you're working with a brand new play and maybe a playwright that maybe doesn't know what yeah. he or she is doing. Yeah. Well, I think if we sign on, if I sign on to that play, mm -hmm. if they've signed on to me, uh, it's because we both see something very special there. I am working on a new musical right now with a writer in Seattle, um, a first time musical. She's mm. never written before. Um, but it's really special. It's a really special story. And uh, while it's not necessarily polished, um, the raw talent and the grit in it is quite wonderful. So right now the challenge is how can we shape it? Um, how can we move it towards production without losing that spirit? Are you co-writing it? No. No, but I'm dramaturging it. You're dramaturging yeah. it. Yeah. Is your, do you have it in your head that maybe someday you'll actually put it on? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And perhaps and perhaps here, I would hope. <laughs> we'll see. It's um yeah, we'll see. I I love to see new musicals. That's part of what I yes, do. Yes, of yeah. course. Um especially with musical theater arts of Pittsburgh, you know. Yeah. And 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 I, you probably know Mark Fleischer at this point. Oh, yeah. at the CLO and yeah. the Spark Festival and all that that's going on this very weekend. Um so that Pittsburgh is vibrant in that way. 100%. Well, what Pittsburgh and the U.S. And I think, US. It, you know, musical theater is an incredible medium for us what, right now. What? Okay, so you've been here for eight months as we're doing this show. <laughs> yes. What is it about Pittsburgh? What? Oh, my what, God. What? It's funny. I, I, 
I always worry about asking people ask me this question a lot, and I always worry about pan, like sounding like I'm pandering. <laughs> well, pander, but I, go right ahead. But I I really <laughs> love this city, and I loved it from the uh, the first time I visited was two falls ago before my final interview for this position. Mm-hmm. I flew out and rented a car, and uh, it was one of those like beautiful fall days when there's air, you know, contrails in the sky, yeah. uh, and um, yeah, I think it's. V- a very beautiful city, but I have to say that I think the reason that I love it and I feel very immediately at home here is the people. I think the people are gritty and genuinely friendly and hardworking, and all of that really resonates with me. So let me tell you, I grew up here, right? Yeah. Because we've already chatted about that, but I grew up here in the city of Pittsburgh, and when I left, which was 400 years ago, for (laughs) a long time in the woods, um, this was an awful place. It was still the, the end of the steel mill era. Yeah. The the air was thick with pollution. Yeah. You could you could literally smell the sky. Um, wow. The water was all polluted in our three rivers. Yeah. Um, it was not particularly upbeat in terms of culture and that sort of art and so on. There was a little bit. Um, and then we lost the steel mills here, mm. and we started moving towards education and medication and medicine and, and um, robotics and things like that. Yeah. And look at this little gem that we have here now. I mean, what a story that is, Steve. It, it I is. Mean, it truly, really is. that renaissance, that revolution, um, and a city that can do that, that's a great place to make art. And sports and yeah. all the rest of it. We're, we're a, a gem of a little city at yeah, this point. Indeed. So Yeah, okay. So, p- and you, I'm a huge football fan, so that helps. Are, are you a Steelers fan? Uh, you know, I've been, I'm in love with a Steelers fan, so I'm sort of a Steelers fan by proxy. <laughs> um, so I split my time. The Steelers and the Seahawks don't play each other very often. I, I, I'm sorry if listeners are, are, are cringing <laughs> at this, but I'm a lifelong diehard Steelers fan. Sorry. Absolutely. If you're of course. You have to be. <laughs> Since I was a little boy, it's never gone away no matter where I've been. Um, all all right, so you are um, you're also a writer who's written stuff from scratch, not just adaptations, sure, yeah. right? As a writer, I'm I always love to ask writers, where do you start your process? Do you start with plot? Do you start with character? Oh, where do you start? Great. Um, yeah, I start with free writing. Um, usually, explain. Uh, free writing is I'll have an idea, right? I'll have a character, or I'll have a location, or I'll have an. Um, a concept about spirituality or politics or a theme. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the first big chapter of my writing will just be free writing on that. And when I say free writing, it's writing without punctuation. Often it's timed, right? It's like creating material, trying to um, create sort of a crucible mm-hmm. for me to um, find where my head is and find where the opportunities are in that theme. And then I'll go back and I'll start editing. And from there, either I'll, I'll connect to a voice, a character, um, or I'll start to outline. So you are an outliner. I do outline. I, I actually... Me, me too. I'm really impressed by people who don't. I have to. Like I said, I, I thrive I in structure. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a hardcore structuralist. Yeah. And I need that structure. Well, screenwriting, of course. It, yeah. I'm, and yeah, I've been it's like that math. Way, but I've been that way my whole life, no matter what I've done. I've yeah. needed the structure. I need to know what, what I'm doing, where I'm going, how it works, before I ever set pen to paper on a, on a draft. Yeah. And then I start to really find things. But is it that way for you too? Absolutely. That's when the creative process starts. I need to know where the I need to create the container and then I can fill it. What tricks do you have for creating characters? Oh, creating characters. Great. Um, you know, I actually borrow a lot of tricks. I taught solo performance for a long time and I only did it, but I taught it. So I have a lot of writing exercises, fill in the blanks, first person writing exercises, and I'll do those from a character perspective. So I'll try to start to understand their inner landscape mm-hmm. um to distill their voice. Do you do you know the work of Lyos Egri? I don't. The art of dramatic writing. Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. So uh, he he defines the three dimensions of character. Yeah. Right, and I think that that to me is a really great trick and technique. Now, this is a really old, musty, and rather intellectual book, academic Come on, book. Yeah. Uh, but th- it's the core of what it all is. It's the three dimensions of character. So it's physiology, sociology, and psychology. Oh, and once you figure out a character on those three dimensions, yeah. then you pretty much have a three dimensional character. Gosh, that's so interesting. It, because, you know, I like to think about when I'm directing mm-hmm. character, mm-hmm. three dimensions of character, um, archetype, stereotype, and of course, um, the actor themselves. Sure. Yeah. So it's funny to think about characters you, and prisms like that. When you're when you're breaking a, a show down to direct, yeah. are you looking for lots of facts and evidence as to how you're going to direct the actors? Are you seeking out the evidence in the play that says that this is how they that character ought to be moving or reacting in that moment? 
Uh, rigorously. 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 Yeah, I do two processes um, for circumstances. Mm-hmm. One is the givens, right? The, the rules of engagement, mm-hmm. the world of the play. And the other before each scene is the immediate circumstances. What's happened in the last 24 hours before that scene begins. Um, because absolutely. that's where they're coming from to go to. Absolutely. But I try not to control or manage the emotional landscape for the actors oh, too I hope much. You I don't. no, I so I feel like if we can really agree on circumstances that allows a, pr- a that starts to build a playground I for mean, them. I mean, uh, you know, emotional mapping is just not a good thing at all. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't end up end well. It never usually. it never ends because well. Because it gets stale. It's one yeah. of the one of the things that I have a hard time breaking certain students of is the notion of telling actors how to do every emotional moment. Yeah. Because the actor's going to just go with that moment however it comes yeah. and they they're not going to contrive that moment yeah it's it's one of the reasons structure is so handy right what's exactly. the tactic what's the objective what's do, the container do you find that when you put a show on and then okay now it's in run yeah do you find that sometimes that gets out of control with some actors oh it's so interesting there were a lot of evolutions in tempest mm-hmm and I was working with a... Cr- and Bio Tamara has been on the show. Oh, yeah. Tamara, Gosh, Tamara Tooney. What She's an fantastic. incredible artist. We yeah. had such a good time collaborating. I can't wait to have her back, really. Um, but I also got to collaborate with a terrific stage manager on Tempest. And I think as a director, you know, we, we have to link arms with our stage managers when we talk about sure. the evolution through the run. Sure. So there were several shifts, pauses, reinterpretations, <laughs> new, mo- new moments yeah. that the actors found. Yeah. Um, and I had this great stage manager who would check in with me every so often. I'd try to come, but she's, of course, on more um, and would say, you know, this really feels in line with what we were building, even though it's new. Uh, what do you think? Uh, and we would have That's a nice. conversation about what what is really the play blossoming and what is the play going off the rails. That's really good. I, You know, I've, I've, I don't want to tell you how many shows I've worked on in my life. A, a lot. And I don't think I've worked with a whole bunch of stage managers that would go that far. Oh, yeah. Gosh, it's so great. It's so great to have that kind of partner in the rehearsal Most room. of them think, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into the director's world. They're going to they're going to do everything they need to do, but not dig into that artistic end of it. I think that happens a lot. And I think it's so curious with stage managers because certainly they, more than anybody else, except for perhaps actors, see so many different directors' work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They actually know so much about how plays and productions of work. Course. So to not le- lean into some of that insight, um, yeah, feels like a waste I to think me. that's great. Okay, I, I ask lots of people this question. Uh-oh, yes. And I, and I always get interesting answers. <laughs> what makes for you, what makes a good story good? Mm. It's a it's a tough mm-hmm. question because it's a little little on the amorphous side. Yeah. What what appeals to you when you're looking for stories? What is the thing? Can you think of a pattern of things that you that appeal to you? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's hard to have a story without conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, conflict. That's the big one. Uh, for me, it's heart. If I'm not emotionally engaged in a story, it's very difficult for me to um, have stakes in it. You have to lean in, don't you? I really do. It's just the kind of person I am, the kind of listener and the kind of storyteller. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also, you know, um, I'm reading a wonderful book right now called The Seas by Samantha Hunt. And it's a work of fiction. um, And it keeps surprising me. And so I think another thing that I need in a good story is uh, broken expectation. Something unexpected. set up. But it but paid off in a way you don't think it's coming. Yeah, and I think in order to really achieve a broken expectation, you have to achieve many expectations before that, right? Sure. You have to build a sense of trust and absolutely um, and structure. And one of the things that you, I think that you can't do in in what you're talking about is is then cheat the reader or the audience. You can't cheat them. It has to be set up. Oh yeah, it can't be sensational. It cannot. It's got to be, be genuine. It cannot be a Deus Ex Machina. Yeah. It has to be set up. Yeah. And if you do that well. And pay it off in a surprising way. Yeah. Audiences love that. It's so satisfying. It's truly because it, satisfying. It, and it feels like it's a living it's a living moment that it, we're having with the story rather than something that's happened before. And it's even better, I think, when it winds up being that the audience thinks that they're learning it or, or getting re- re- revelation for the first time. Yeah. That is, sucks them in. It's so sweet. Isn't that the sweetest moment? It, it is. Yeah. And then I've come to uh, uh, go off tangent for half a second, which is that um, I have come to the conclusion over a long time of doing this that there is a drug in storytelling that addicts us, mm. and it's called catharsis. Oh. And without catharsis, you it's the reason why, in my opinion, why we come back 
to, we want to see a story again. Yeah. It's a reason why we want to see a new story so that hopefully we get to that cathartic moment so that we go home feeling uplifted and relieved of whatever our own emotions are. And I think catharsis is the singular drug of storytelling. So, Steve, that's so interesting. And I'm just curious because, of course, we have Aristotle's poetics, yes. right, that sort of lays the groundwork for that. But I'm curious how you define that in your teaching Cath- or in your work. Catharsis? Yeah. It's an emotional purging. An emotional, an, an emotional purging. So, uh, it, it, and it's always always needs to come at the resolution of whatever the character's arc was. Yeah. So the character's arc for me is there's at an inciting incident early on in the show, uh, we get a want, the protagonist has a want, and that want has to be paid off by a need. The want is defined so that the audience knows what it is, but the need doesn't ever have to be mentioned or said. Mm. And that is a character arc. And and when that arc goes from inciting incident to climax and resolution into catharsis Mm. that audience will pay a lot of money to come back time and again it's why the really big popular movies even the popcorn movies (laughs) have to have that Absolutely. Well, gosh, Steve, that's so interesting. Because isn't that how we all hope life works? It, it is. Yeah. We want that emotional relief. Yeah, we and want a resolution. We think about a, how many shows yeah. or TV shows or books that you've read, and you didn't get that. And you thought, eh. Yeah. You just didn't care. Yeah, so interesting. Right? That's very insightful. So yeah. so that I just think that that's where... I mean, who who could do it better than Shakespeare? You know, sure. um, all of those emotional things. Okay, so what kinds of stories do you tend to avoid that you mm-hmm. you you uh, you consider and you go, yeah, nah, not so much. Gosh, that's such a great question. Um, stories that have no heart, I guess. Yeah, stories um, that, that sort of. Uh, um, I, well, you know, I've used the word before, uh, which is sort of heady, but didactic stories—stories mm-hmm. stories that feel like they're trying to teach me a lesson. Um, I, I don't respond well to those. I want to discover the lesson, not be taught. Do you? Do you? Right. You want to discover. That's the key: yeah. is discovering the lesson, not have it spoon-fed to you. That's right. You don't that's want a story right. that's that's purposely out loud teaching you a lesson. You want it to come in the in the fabric of the story. Yeah, and you know, I. I've had several scripts pass over my desk in the last few months um, that are looking back on history. I think mm. I think we have an appetite right now as a culture to do that, and those those stories are particularly difficult, right? Because we can so often start with a conclusion, um, but a fi- but great plays don't start with a conclusion; they start with a question. Right? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, all right, I, I, what would you say that you have learned in the last you know twenty years of your career? <laughs> <laughs> that you would continue, that you know that you will always continue to do. Oh, that I will always continue to do. In other words, you've learned, I've yeah. got to always do this. Yeah. I will say that um, I learned really early as a young performer, but, you know, I was never an ingenue. You know, at 12, I was like a leading lady, you know, like I, so <laughs> I, um, I learned really early to make my own opportunities, that if I have an appetite to create mm. something, to not wait for permission to do that. And, you know, that looks and sounds in all different kinds of ways in a career, but that has really helped there, shape my career. There is a pa- I'm a pattern recognitionist. Yeah. I recognize patterns over time. And one of the patterns in this show has been that um, um, artists must get to that. They must define themselves. In other words, an artist must... Um, frequently must start and conclude and go through their own process and not wait for others to come and ask. Yes, They must set up their own plays. They must set up their own productions in order to get where they're trying to go. Absolutely. Have you read that William Gibson book, Pattern Recognition? Oh, no. Oh, it's wonderful. Yes. It's wonderful, yeah. That'll go on the list. Yeah. (laughs) A book to see. Okay, well, um, um, I'm going to give you our last two questions of the day. Um, You've been at this for some time now. Can you give us um, a, a, are you, do you have an oddball or a quirky or a funny or an offbeat or a weird story that you can relate that the audience might find very intriguing? (laughs) Maybe. Um, Probably all my funniest stories come from starting that theater company back in Seattle with that group of friends. And, you know, when we um, were given access to this 49 seat theater space, um, there was a film organization in there before us and we negotiated a lease and uh, they said okay we're going to leave the air conditioning but we're going to take the seats and so we were like (laughs) okay great and John Jerry was mentoring us through that at that moment and uh, you know we were very overwhelmed we put down a deposit we all pooled our money 
Uh, and uh, we're so scared. And I remember John Jory saying, oh, man, uh, after a year of this, you can parachute parachute into a war zone. You'll say, this is nothing. <laughs> I founded a theater company. Um, but so we had to find seats. So we were searching Craigslist. You know, we didn't want just folding chairs. We wanted theater chairs. Uh, and we found um, out in Seattle, you know, there's a series of islands off the coast. Yes. And we found an I have, old... I have friends who live on Bainbridge. Oh, yeah. It's so beautiful up there. And uh, there's uh, there's an old horse arena on one of those islands. Okay. So one of our members of our uh, ensemble theater company's parents owned a catering business. Mm -hmm. So we took their uh, cooling trucks up there uh, to Anacortes <laughs> um, and uh, uh, removed all of these seats from this horse arena that had been not being used. Were you part of the crew that physically removed the Oh, yeah. Seat? There oh, were okay. 11 of us, and it was like 11 of us plus our brothers. Um, and so we got them back. We installed them, but we were finding hay in them through the course of the first year. And we never really got rid of the smell. Um, yeah. But it was wonderful. And we did all that in like in three months before we opened our first show. Our first show was a rolling premiere by Jane Martin called Laura's Bush. Oh. Um, and I got to play the illustrious librarian, Laura Bush. Um, and I still remember opening night um we were all standing backstage ready for our, our first opening night and one of our moms uh peeked behind the curtain and said i changed the toilet paper because <laughs> of course the bathroom was on stage so it was really a family affair did you have people come up from the audience and go use the bathroom during the show we tried to uh, we encouraged them to wait till intermission yeah oh my lord <laughs> it was fun though it was really i did fun. A, i did an enormous amount of equity waiver theater in los angeles yeah so i understand all of those issues totally, 99 totally. seats which is double what you had but yeah. but nevertheless yeah all those issues all right do you have a singular piece of advice um for those who are just trying to break in now or maybe trying they're in but they're trying to get to that next level do you have a good tip or advice yeah, somebody was just asking me about this. I a couple things come to mind. You know, when I was graduating from graduate school and everybody was telling me to go to L.A. or New York, mm -hmm. uh, but my heart was really in creating this theater company. Um, I was doing an audition for P.J. Paparelli, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the end of the audition, he had a little extra time. And, of course, I was this graduating MFA student. And he's like, do you have any other questions? And I literally turned to him and I said, what should I do? You know, I explained to him my situation. Uh, and he, he, I remember so clearly, he's like, just remember it's a really long life. Mm. You got a long time to go to New York and a long time to go to L.A. You got mm -hmm. a long time to do everything you need. Sure. Um, so that feels a little... Um, Heart-wrenching now, as PJ, of course, left this world a few years ago. Um, but I, I feel that way with actor, young actors and young artists. There's a lo it's a long time to find ourselves. You know, it's a lifelong pursuit to be it, an artist. Don't panic. Don't panic and follow your heart. And yeah, there's no right way to do it. There, well, there is no one path. Absolutely. That's I'm testament keep, to that. That's why I keep asking this question, because I want to hear all the different paths or all the different tips or all the different advice, yeah. because I think it's very valuable for those that are out there I, I like this show. I like to think of this show as something that is valuable for those who are trying to figure it out. Yeah, great. You, you know, know, another one came to mind, if I may share too. Absolutely, please. Um, a very seasoned actress came to visit us uh, when I was in school. And um, I just remember so clearly it, she, someone asked her the same question. Uh, and she said, You just have to keep looking forward. She's like, if you look side to side, you look at what your friends are doing, you look at your competition, you know, you look across the audition room, you're always going to see someone who is dressed better, has more experience and knows the director. You know, <laughs> like there's all, there's always going to be that person. You can't look side to side. You just have to look forward. So the great Brian Cranston was here on campus. I got to interview him yeah. for an hour on campus. And one of the things that he said, which I think is right in line with what you're talking about, which is that you... Um, as a as an artist, as a, as a performer, um, you cannot go and try and, and think that everything is yours. If it's going to come to you, if you're going to get the part, it's your part. If you don't get the part, it's not your part. That's beautiful. And you can't yeah. think of it as you lost that part. No, you didn't lose that part. It was never yours to have. Yeah. Let go of what's not meant for That's us. That's correct. Well, that's yeah. sort of what you're talking about, Absolutely. which I think is very, very valuable. Mariah, this has just been terrific, thank and I, I thank you so much for coming in today. It's we've learned so much. So inspiring, Steve. Thanks for having me. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, 
And may all your stories be unforgettable.